It's Monday. And it's May 23rd. And the word of the day is turophile, which means a lover of cheese. Huh. Used in a sentence, as an aggressive turophile myself, I was recently accepted into the ranks of a cheese cult, but they didn't have a name for the cult yet, so I suggested Heaven's Great. And that's official now. <laughs> Heath, we've been over this. If your cult doesn't have fuck stuff, it's just a club, Heath. We've been over this. Come on, man. I didn't have fuck stuff. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, primary season makes us miss the time of locusts. I'll make a strong case that we should just outsource all our voting stuff to Australia. And against all odds, we learn that Donald Trump is... Even dumber than we already <laughs> thought. <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, No Illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, on a serious note, we never got the chance to scream into the distance for an entire episode last time around because we recorded right before the leak of the draft opinion that's going to reverse Roe v. Wade in Supreme Court. And as much as I could use another good screaming, you know I love a good screaming. I feel like that screaming, that's been every podcast this whole month, um, but maybe a quick little rantlet to start us off, something like that. Ooh, ooh, can we pretend my voice is like this because of the screaming instead of a baby cold? I feel like that's more appealing politically, you know what I'm saying? Well, I don't know, Eli. Baby-related maladies are pretty politically appropriate at this point, too. Yeah, there we go. Okay, well, if you want a real full-size rant about this, check out Lucinda's diatribe on Scathing Atheist a couple weeks ago. If you want to hear from a uterus haver exactly what the screaming sounds like in real words, that's a perfect way to learn about it. Yeah, for sure. Isn't it a great job on that? We'll, we'll yell about that story more as it unfolds. Believe me, it's going to keep unfolding and we're going to yell about it. I was going to say, we're not out of yelling. <laughs> All right. Also, a quick reminder that this month is Matreon, that time of year when we come to you humbly, hat in hand, and ask if you wouldn't mind supporting the show over at Patreon.com. It's through the donation of our patrons that we're able to uh, exist, entire yeah. our whole yeah. existence, our whole yeah. thing. If you don't donate... Does that mean you hate freedom and you want the terrorists to win? Yes, it does. That yep. is what it means. <laughs> so head over to Matreon.com or Patreon.com to help us out. That's M-A-Y-T-R-E-O-N.com to learn all the details, or just go to Patreon.com with a P, and you can donate there. Uh, slash Skeptocrat. Please and thank you. In our lead story tonight, following America's national politics is like watching the world's most boring sport. Right. So I like I know we have a lot of international listeners and I always feel like I should open stories about our elections with an apology for shit being so weird and stupid. Uh, but right now we're in midterm primary season, uh, which technically started with Texas's primary at the beginning of March and technically lasts all the way through Election Day on November 8th since Louisiana's primary and their election are the same fucking thing. But for practical purposes, Texas's primary is like a preseason game. As were Indiana and Ohio's May 3rd primaries, as were Nebraska and West Virginia's on May 17th, uh, mostly because there's only two states at a time and nobody gives a fuck and that's not even enough to make Steve Kornacki sweat. Uh, so in a convoluted sense that I'm mostly just manufacturing for the purposes of this story, opening day of <laughs> primary season was last Tuesday when Idaho, Kentucky, North Carolina, Oregon and Pennsylvania all went to the polls to pick their midterm candidates. So we're going to talk about that. Yeah, and I'm just going to rewind for a second for the American listeners. Elections are things that happen every year. All we do time. them all the time. That doesn't uh, sound right. They're basically a really simple strategy game, like the simplest possible strategy game that we all lose when millions of people refuse to play most of the time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or if I may indulge in another metaphor, elections are like the siege of Gondor and way too many of us are like eating a sloppy tomato and demanding that Joe Biden sing you another song. <laughs> okay. I, I think I see what you're saying, but I don't, I don't think you have the details of all okay. that. Right? Brett Kavanaugh is the one ring. No, nope. me out. No, he's not. Now, <laughs> I, you know what? Mount Doom is in a real place. Yes, he is. Fine. Sure. <laughs> Now, Idaho and Kentucky can obviously fuck off. Nobody cares. A bunch of Republican bullshit happened, I guess. Oregon is uh, it's obviously an objectively better state than those two, but there were no contentious races of national interest there either. Uh, and as for North Carolina, 
We'll we'll put a pin in that one. It uh, deserves its own headline. <laughs> so what we're actually going to talk about is the Pennsylvania primary, where two interesting and variably terrifying storylines are unfolding. The first is the one that I talked about on last week's scathing diatribe, and that would be the widely predicted victory of 2020 election denier, Christian nationalist, and full bore conspiracy theorist Doug Mastriano. Uh, and to give you an idea how frightening this guy is, the Guardian's headline on this story accurately reads, "Quote." The Trump loyalist who could be a major threat to U.S. democracy. I like how other papers are now reporting on us the way we talk about, like, war-torn countries and commercials for UNICEF. Right, yeah, yeah. we've earned it. So for Just the cost of a cup of coffee a day, you can help an American who screams every day into the void about their politics. <laughs> So now before throwing his hat in the gubernatorial ring, Doug Mastriano was a Pennsylvania state senator who earned a national reputation for being one of the most full-throated advocates of Trump's election lies in the entire fucking country. He helped the Trump administration set up the pseudo hearing where they presented their nonsensical claims of fraud. He helped them plot a way to appoint fake Trump supporting electors in Pennsylvania to subvert the will of the state's electorate. And he has supported their efforts to decertify the election, which is both treasonous and impossible. I had no fucking idea what was up with that. Uh, he announced his candidacy at a QAnon rally. He's campaigned at events that platform 9-11 truthers, and he has told everyone that cares to listen that he honestly believes he's on a mission from God to make sure Trump isn't cheated out of the presidency again in 2024. And while the governor doesn't have the power to nuh -uh a presidential election, failing to certify the results could put us in unprecedented waters in terms of the democratic process. Okay, if you're running on the platform of not doing the job, no, you're not. You're not yeah, running. Yeah. You're not allowed to run. We don't need a fucking precog in a waiting pool to figure this out. He's announcing pre-treason. Plus, he already did a treason. Yep. How is there not a law about this? Okay. Counterpoint, counterpoint. He is the reason that a camera was pointed at Melissa Carone. So, you know, pluses, minuses. She was in she was in Michigan, wasn't she? Yeah, she was in Michigan. But good news about her. She tried to run for office and she didn't file the paperwork on time. Oh, amazing. She's all mad. So she's not going to be on the ballot. She couldn't find her shoes. Um, and <laughs> while Mastriano is definitely the scariest result out of the Pennsylvania primary, it wasn't the only scary one. Uh, there's also the matter of the razor-thin contest for the Republican Senate nomination between former hedge fund manager David McCormick and masculine Gwyneth Paltrow, Dr. Mehmet Oz. As of this recording, their race remains too close to call, with Oz leading by just over 1,000 votes. Uh, that's a close enough margin to trigger an automatic recount, assuming McCormick doesn't concede in the next couple of days, which seems like a pretty safe assumption. Of course, despite the fact that there's a whole process for dealing with this kind of shit, Trump has publicly urged Dr. Oz to just declare victory anyway because in his warped and dementia-riddled brain, some portion of American politics is decided via the time-honored tradition of calling dibs. Yeah, also, Dr. Oz looks like a vampire who became a doctor just to get access to blood. That's, yeah. that's what he yeah. looks like. That's I don't terrifying. know, Heath. That, that's not fair. Vampires have killed way less people than Dr. Oz has. No, that's, that's yeah, even statistically if true. they were real. So obviously we'll be following both of these stories as they develop, but there's one more that I wanted to highlight that's coming up in tomorrow's primaries, actually, and that's the primary in my home state of Georgia. Now, it, it looks like it's already pretty clear who's going to win all of the major primaries, so I can already go ahead and tell you the major stories are going to be Trump's preferred gubernatorial candidate getting his ass handed to him by the decidedly still evil Brian Kemp, and the unabashed lunacy of Republicans actually nominating Herschel fucking Walker to the Senate. <laughs> Fuck yeah! I, I could do an entire story on how crazy that shit is. But Now, I, I should say, though, it, 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 it is worth noting that when he faces off against Raphael Warnock, it'll mark the first time that two African-Americans have both been nominated to the same Senate seat by the major parties, which is kind of cool, even if one of them is insane. But the Georgia story that I wanted to bring up is about turnout, right? So as you'll recall, in the wake of Georgia electing two Democratic senators in the 2020 runoff, a terrified Republican state government set about enacting every law they could think of to make voting harder. It's the one that made it illegal to give people water while they were in line and resulted in shit like Major League Baseball taking the all-star game out of Atlanta and Donald Trump pretending to boycott Coca-Cola for a day and a half. <laughs> At most. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Well, if the primary is anything to go by, it looks like their plan backfired because there was a huge surge in voting across the board in the state. Of course, Kemp and his ilk are trying to use this fact as proof that the Democratic fears about the legislation were overblown, but that is absolute fucking bullshit. Okay, first of all, 
the legislation was watered way the hell down before it passed precisely because of those fears. And also, and this matters, voting was harder. Yep. Right. There were fewer early voting days. There were fewer drop boxes. There were fewer mail in ballots. Yes, more people voted, but they had to work harder to do it. That was the point. It's just that Republicans in power are so dangerous that even if they had to wrestle bears in the fucking polling station, people would have done it. Yeah. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our first sponsor this week. Policy Genius. And then this is going to be like a kitchen island. Love it. Granite countertops. Actually, we have a great marble guy. Ooh, I love a good marble guy. Hey, Thiele, what are you guys doing? Oh, hey, Noah. Just walking E through some of the project I'm going to do on the place. How are we supposed to pay for that? Did you sell Marsh's organs again? No, no. Marsh's all out of organs. I'm doing it with the money I saved using Policy Genius. What's Policy Genius? Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need. Just head to policygenius.com to get started. Policy Genius will show you price estimates for policies that fit your search. If you like what they find, they'll get you switched over for free. It's true. Customers who bundled their home and auto policies with Policy Genius saved an average of $1,250 per year over what they were paying. Plus, the Policy Genius team works for you, not the insurance companies. And they don't add on extra fees or sell your data to third parties. Well, that's good to know. Where do I sign up? Head over to policygenius.com to get your free home insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Policy Genius. Granite frickin' countertops. Yeah, or or just saving money on your home insurance. Boo. I mean, I guess that too. Thought you were going with your good marble guy. <laughs> <laughs> And we're back. Next up in headlines in Merrily We Roll Along News. Remember that pin Noah ever so gently pushed into the North Carolina <laughs> primary like a silly acupuncturist? I'm well, so happy. It's time to yank that baby out because Madison Cawthorn lost his primary for his congressional seat in a surprising upset last week because while all that stuff I just mentioned doesn't matter Republicans... Touching another dude's junk does. So pop the champagne and restart the congressional coke party slash orgies. He's headed out the door. I feel like Liz Warren would be fun at a coke party, right? Oh, Dear. no. Strong disagree. What? You're, you're, you're trying to talk about your business idea and she's trying to set up a like get out the vote campaign. Totally kill your buzz. Help my boss. Yeah, I, I mean, let's be fair. If there's one thing that Madison Cawthorn actually is qualified for it's life of the Coke party, right? That's true. I mean, as long as he's wearing a shot collar and not allowed around anybody's genitals, that is. I don't think I would need the Coke for that party. That's just a party yeah, by true. itself with the <laughs> shot collar. Yeah. Now, Cawthorn's been saying for months now that the Republican establishment wants him out of office pretty much every time another insane scandal breaks out. And batshit insane as he is and real as those scandals were, in this case, he's actually right. I haven't seen Republicans so unified on an issue since, you know, women had rights. So just as one example, a PAC linked to Republican Senator Tom Tillis spent over $300,000 on attack ads against Cawthorn. And terrifyingly, I should point out that Cawthorn's opponent, State Senator Chuck Edwards, only beat him by 1%. Yeah. Yeah. 32% of the voters in this primary were still like, I want the face fucking insider trading guy. I like the cut of his jail. <laughs> so one more thing about this story. There's actually another unexpected bonus to this event, which is that Madison Cawthorn may spend the lead up to the actual election, the, the one against the Democrat, stabbing his own party in the back. So immediately after his defeat, he like, swore vengeance on those in the establishment who sought to take him down while thanking his true allies like, and I'm not making this up, white supremacist podcasters and Tucker Carlson. Yeah, he posted right after he lost that it's time for dark MAGA to take revenge on the GOP. I, I guess the GOP is light MAGA in his yeah, head and yeah. now he's part of dark MAGA. In the same post, he wrote... The time for Gentile politics, as usual, has come to an end. <laughs> and then one of his aides was definitely like, hey, man, a uh, proud public Hitler enthusiast who visited that guy's mansion on vacation. That person, that's you, by the way, 
probably shouldn't say Gentile politics very often. <laughs> so uh, he corrected it to obviously genteel is what he was trying to say. <laughs> no, I'm not quite so sure. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> very possibly a Freudian slip there. Yeah, but so but luckily, though, it turns out that maggots are terrified of anything darker than mayonnaise. So I feel like his threat is probably hollow. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, and here's the thing, right, about that, like stabbing the Republicans in the back. Despite what my impersonation of everyone from there sounds like, North Carolina Republicans really can't afford to have their race sabotaged by a third party candidate. What I'm saying is th there's like a chance now that the long term legacy of Madison Cawthorn might be looking fabulous in a nighty and losing the Republicans a seat in Congress, which I mean, I might love Madison Cawthorn now. I'm very conflicted. I have a lot of feelings. <laughs> I'm really this is hard. Yeah, fair. And in Wizards of the Cast news. Nice. Well done. Blizzard Entertainment ranked the races last they week. Did. They did. <laughs> like like unironically, <laughs> like for real. They did they really, really did that. For anyone who's not familiar, Blizzard is the company that created some of the most popular fantasy games, including World of Warcraft and Overwatch and Hearthstone. Well, it looks like they wanted players to create characters that are more inclusive and diverse. So they started working on a diversity space tool, is what they called it, and they released that along with a blog post explaining how it works last week. And the way it works is literally ranking the races. That's yeah. it. Again, they really did this. And they also ranked the gender identities and the sexual orientations and the body types in that tool. They tried to fight for diversity with the eugenics companion app. It did not go well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it turns out we're saying you're better at Arcana isn't the defense they were hoping it would be. <laughs> no, no. If Twitter is what happens when you ask bug-eyed lizard boys what the limits of free speech should be, this is what happens when their mid-year project is racial inclusion. <laughs> it's it's the Heath explaining to a woman that he doesn't like phone calls of diversity. What? It doesn't even make sense. That is perfectly reasonable. Free speech. So this definitely <laughs> seems like it was based on good intentions at Blizzard, but the level of stupidity in the execution of that is breathtaking. They set up a system to visualize the diversity of your character by looking at seven different personal attribute categories. And here they are. These are the seven facets of humanity in their Whoa. head. Culture, ethnicity, age, body type, sexual orientation, gender identity and ability just okay. ability uh so guys if you're gonna play a blonde haired blue-eyed muscle man that guy's got to be gay as shit okay <laughs> like just <laughs> kind of yes I, I like that they included age, though. I feel like middle-aged fantasy adventurers are an underexplored aspect of the genre, you know? <laughs> so, like, I, I want to use my bonus action to rub the kink out of my back and exhale real slowly. <laughs> the quest for a comfortable chair. <laughs> Just going to use, but I'm going to roll for flush and plum on this measure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's flush and plum. Good. So... The diversity tool, it lets you visualize your character as a collection of scores within each of those seven categories by graphing you inside a heptagon. The closer you are to the edge of the graph along each spoke, the higher your score for that attribute. So at this point, you might be wondering, what the fuck does score mean yeah. with respect to a character's ethnicity, for example? Yeah. What's a score for ethnicity? Great question. The answer is, don't do that. Don't, yeah. don't create a thing that does that. But Blizzard was not aware of that answer. They assigned a score from 0 to 10 for each of those categories. So I think 0 is meant to represent like a cishet white guy, meaning 0 in terms of diversity. But the whole system is insane. To give you an idea, here's how the stats lined up for the character Anna from Overwatch. Culture, Egyptian, 7. Race, Arab, seven. That's seven out of ten as a score for those things. Okay. Age, 60 years old, also seven points. Cognitive ability, reason, zero. Physical ability. I have questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have questions, too. There's more, though. Physical ability, one-eyed, four. Okay. So, yeah, they also literally ranked... Disabilities here. Interesting. 
continuing. There's a few more. Body type, slim and curvy, yep. zero. Just like most people. <laughs> Gender identity, woman, five. five. Sexual orientation, heterosexual, zero. Okay, I get the last one. Okay. I can literally taste the penis-only room where they decided that being a woman was a five. <laughs> I, I can hear the whole yes. conversation. Yes. Okay, I I need to know what ethnicity and culture they think is a 10 what what were they doing they yeah. had to come up with this right the Albino. most diverse of the ethnicities <laughs> yeah what the fuck does that mean <laughs> I, that's crazy i, I want to know what the other cognitive abilities are sure yeah I, so many questions and yeah the internet had lots of questions too the most popular was what yeah so mm -hmm. within hours of releasing the race ranker tool Blizzard did a big edit on the original post, and they tried to explain themselves. They added, quote, There's been conversation online regarding the diversity space tool, especially concerning its intent and our commitment to diversity. We've edited this post to clarify that this prototype is not being used in active game development. We would like to add the following comment for additional context. It was, it was somebody in that voice at HR being like, Oh my God, I can't believe I have to do this. For sure. And then from there, they went on to explain... How the race ranker is not a substitute for any diversity initiatives, and it will not be used in real life hiring at the company Blizzard. Oh, good. That's why would you say that? When you say that, now I know that it was gone. It's so much That's worse than now you said I that. know. Yeah. Now, all that being said, they mentioned that their in game content is made by development teams exclusively with the very obvious subtext of yeah lots of milky white cishet zero scores in that group at development teams i think we all know that bottom line the whiteboard at blizzard went back to zero days since a workplace race ranking and you, you hate to see it you do you do i mean to be fair to wizards of the coast their choices were create a complex numerical system outlining how difficult they personally felt each kind of thing to be or think was, or hiring an actual woman or person of color. <laughs> so you can see how they had no choice, right? But, a, but also, like, the excuse is so, like, so you weren't using it for anything or planning to use it for anything? <laughs> Right. Right. Like, I know that's a bullshit post hoc excuse and all, but you guys see how we rank the sexual orientations for our own satisfaction makes it worse, right? Yeah, so much worse. You guys just did that for funsies? What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> if you turn the corner in a grocery store and someone says, I wasn't going to fuck this, they were going <laughs> to fuck that. Their dick was already in that, most likely. <laughs> wow. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick. And I'm Heath Enright. Come on, guys. Let me back in. You know, burnout can take lots of different forms. And there's lots of ways of dealing with it. For instance, here at Puzzle in a Thunderstorm, we prevent burnout by physically forcing no illusions to take a vacation once in a while. Come on, guys. Ju like, just for the end. I I'll go right back no. out, I promise. No, not falling for that again. And while we can't come to your house and force you to go on vacation, if you're dealing with burnout, you might consider better help. What's better help? See, that's work. I'm basically already in the ad. You guys might as well just let me in now. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. And Skeptocrat listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Skeptocrat. Now get out of here. You go. Go on vacation. But what if you guys mess it up? Yeah, man. I mean, we're gonna. You yeah, know we're, we're gonna. worse at this job than you. Well, well, that doesn't make me feel better. Go hiking. I don't, I don't wanna. And we're back. Next up in headlines in A Saucer's What I Saw, Sir News, 
in yet another <laughs> reminder why we shouldn't elect conspiracy theory lunatics to high office, the U.S. Congress took time out amidst an escalating European war, an economic downturn, rising racial tensions, and an increasingly brazen internal threat to democracy itself to ask an exasperated Pentagon official if we really have wrecked alien spaceships in Area 51. <laughs> Last Tuesday's hearing marked the first time in a half century that U.S. officials offered up public testimony about UFOs, and despite the long hiatus, nothing new or significant came from the hearing. No. Get so out of here. weird. I mean, except maybe what a bunch of gullible jackasses we have running the show in Washington, but I feel like we knew that, too. Okay, but even if this was all real, what was the win they were picturing, the people who were asking those questions? Like, the Pentagon guy was going to be like, fuck, yeah, okay. It's my daughter's wedding. You asked me three times. Yeah, we have alien stuff. (laughs) What? No, because it's a congressional hearing, so you have to pinky promise that you're not hiding alien life from us. Right, yeah. Yeah. Now, the stated reason for the hearing was the increase in reports of UFO sightings by military personnel needed explanation. But, But this rise coincides with a push by the military to encourage people to come forward with UFO sightings. So it didn't need explanation. That's the explanation. Right. And in the military's defense, like that push actually makes perfect sense. Right. So given that UFO sightings are usually the domain of lunatics and attention seeking nincompoops, there was a fear that military personnel would be hesitant to report something that could get them lumped in with that group. Uh, But if there's like a weird, unexplained craft floating around a military base, that should absolutely get set up the chain of command. Right. So that was the whole idea. But of course, inevitably, that leads to a rise in reports, which fuels the fantasies of those aforementioned lunatics and nincompoops, some of whom have seats in Congress, apparently. Yeah, some guys sitting there on the radar. Hey, Dave, should we report this missile shaped thing coming at us from North Korea? You know, you know what? Never mind. Everyone's going to make fun of us. Let's just let it go. Let's let it go. (laughs) What am I, Madison Cawthorn? <laughs> so, so naturally, the line of questioning was every bit as embarrassing and silly as you'd expect. But the real standout was, in my opinion, Illinois Democratic Representative Raja Krishnamurthy, who, in addition to asking Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence Scott W. Bray, quote, have we come across any wreckage of any kind of object that has now been examined by you, end quote, asked whether we had sensors underwater that might, you know, catch alien fish should they come for a visit. What? And at this point, Bray has to be like, uh, hey man, are you asking me in a public hearing to describe in detail the kind of underwater sensors that the military operates in its coastal regions? At which point, Krishnamurthy was like, yeah, okay, no, now that you say it out loud, I hear it too. So I, yep, I heard it that time. Okay, for the next hearing, we need to get Bray, the naval intelligence guy, a flashy thing from Men in Black. Just something that looks like the flashy thing. So he can be like, oh, do we have sensors for alien sharks? Sorry, what were you saying? (laughs) I just need him to fuck with them more. Amen. But of course, the singular snippet that most people saw was this high-ranking Pentagon official playing a pretty unimpressive video of an unidentified aerial phenomena and saying, I do not have an explanation for what this specific object is. Uh, what they didn't see was the comically long time he spent immediately after that trying to accommodate congressional requests to pause on precisely the like frame or two of that video where the thing passes in front of the camera. Uh, but to be clear, despite a near century long effort to collect definitive evidence of UFOs and despite all but four people in this country carrying cameras with them at all fucking times, we're still firmly in the okay, but what's that barely visible blur in those three frames then territory where we will no doubt remain? Oh, man. I swear, if we meet the aliens and they turn out to be, like, doing that to us on purpose, so good. (laughs) Great prank. Yep. And in How Tweet It Is News, ex-professor and current world record self-owned champion Jordan Peterson came steaming out of retirement this week to call a swimsuit model not beautiful and then got owned so hard for it, he quit Twitter in a huff. Because if there's anything Jordan Peterson has his brand built on, it's being mindful of other people's feelings. (laughs) I'm going to start my own marketplace of ideas with cocaine and demand to meet my supply of ideas. You're right, yes. (laughs) Yeah, if you ever doubted the nuclear-level hypocrisy that white cishet men are capable of, he's in a huff about how inconsiderate people were in insulting his insults. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. 
Okay, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Jordan Peterson, I, I mean, gosh, I'm just so glad you're here. I wasted several years of my life on this asshole, so it should have some benefit now. So Peterson was a professor of who the fuck cares at a university in Canada who rose to fame by claiming that an anti-discrimination bill would see teachers fired and even arrested for refusing to acknowledge students' preferred pronouns. Uh, that's not what happens, what happened? by the way. No, no, um, that didn't happen, and, okay. Weird thing, nobody who wasted a year of my life arguing with me that it would has ever acknowledged that fact. But to be fair, that's probably because they died of COVID. So, you know. Or they're in Canadian gulags and can't get a message out. Oh, possible. Possible. Hmm. Fingers crossed. Anyway, Peterson <laughs> took a transphobic stand against this bill, promising not to use any of his students' preferred pronouns, which made him a darling of the alt-right, especially because he was slightly better at dressing up their half-assed ideas with fancy words and calling it philosophy. He wrote a best-selling book telling racist losers to clean their room, got addicted to painkillers, put himself into a medically induced coma to try to kick his addiction, which almost killed him, and then, realizing that his university actually wasn't going to fire him, like he fantasized about, he quit his job and nobody gave a fuck. So... It was a day that ended in Y last week, which means that Joe Poe needed some attention, so he tweeted a photo of this year's Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, which featured a plus-sized model, Yumi Nu, on its cover. And with that photo, he tweeted the quote, Sorry, not beautiful, and no amount of authoritarian tolerance is going to change that. End quote. Okay, here's the actual sequence of events. Jordan Peterson, that model is ugly. Internet, you look like your brandy snifter was the wrong grail. What the fuck are you talking about? You shouldn't comment on appearances. Peterson, you're all fascists on this free speech platform. I'm leaving. Internet, who the fuck was that guy? Yeah, right. Who, yeah, right. That? who left in a huff just now? Eh, and, who cares? And look, I know I'm hardly the first person to point this out, but authoritarian tolerance mm -hmm. <laughs> what are those words like <laughs> hey guys if the people sees the means of production the communists won't be able to get them <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about yeah so as a result of his observation as heath pointed out uh, quite a few people mentioned that he looks like anthony bourdain's dead body and so <laughs> as is always the case when hardcore conservatives get a taste of their own medicine he wrote a series of tweets about how mean everyone is and promised he was quitting twitter forever saying quote i told my staff to change my password to keep me from temptation and am departing once again if I have something to say, I'll write an article or make a video. If the issue is not important enough to justify that, then perhaps it would be best to just let it go. End oh, quote. Don't worry, Jordy. You will not have anything to say. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, one last thing about this article, the NBC news article I linked that I got this story from has the shadiest and most beautiful possible last line. I had to share it with you after quoting his sad little temper tantrum slash exit. The article ends quote, Peterson's Twitter account has since posted multiple times. <laughs> <end quote. laughs> and finally tonight, we have a story about Donald Trump's knowledge of meteorology. And we're done. And yeah, we're done. There it was. Mm -hmm. We also have a story about Donald Trump trying to do presidential weather stuff while he was in office, like a bunch. Two high level national security people who worked in the administration during 2017 and 2018 spoke with Rolling Stone magazine last week about an issue that Trump kept talking about. Trump was quite certain that China had a secret technology that would create synthetic hurricanes and then shoot them at the United States. Yeah. What? And apparently he brought this up like constantly. The president of the United States at the time thought that China was shooting us with a hurricane gun. Yeah. That's real. I'm picturing a young, fresh faced, tall Tyler just being like, oh, okay, this is a prank, right? Like, there's a the hazing thing you guys do to the new guy. <laughs> I'm picturing tall Tyler going, well, well, yes, Mr. President, but luckily, remember, we can change the direction of a hurricane with a Sharpie. See? Which is right here on the map. <laughs> so, I'm definitely not an expert in weather guns, uh, but neither is anybody. That's not a thing, I don't think. Uh, what I can tell you with absolutely no expertise, 
China doesn't have a secret hurricane gun. <laughs> no. Nope. That's not a thing they have. If they did have that, I feel like we'd have more hurricanes probably. It doesn't seem like you'd sandbag that technology. You'd use it. But Trump was convinced that this was a thing for years, and he bothered the staff about it constantly. This became such a ridiculous waste of time that the White House people were calling it the hurricane gun thing. And according to one of the national security people, quote, it was almost too stupid for words. I did not get the sense he was joking at all. In particular, Trump wanted to know if hurricane guns count as an official act of war by a foreign power. Jesus. And mm. therefore, hurricane season was an annual act of Chinese aggression that justified a military retaliation. So wait, his reaction to learning that our enemies have technology powerful beyond our imaginations was to declare war on them? That's correct. <laughs> he, he did somehow make it dumber. He made it, he yeah. made it dumber. Also, and I feel like this matters from a gun perspective. That's not the direction China's in, right? Like, I mean, eventually it is, but like hurricanes come from African coast, the African coast. Like, I, I feel like China finished their hurricane gun and they were like, oh, fuck, guys, the winds go this. Like, unless we go to war with Vietnam or the Philippines, this is going to be pretty much useless <laughs> for us. <laughs> and here's the account from the other national security expert whose job included two years of fielding questions about hurricane guns. Again, national security experts spent a whole bunch of time dealing with this. Quote, I was present when Trump asked if China made hurricanes to send us. He wanted to know if the technology existed. One guy in the room responded, not to the best of my knowledge, sir. <laughs> I kept it together until I got back to my office. I don't know where he would have heard about that. He was asking about it around the time he asked about nuking hurricanes, end quote. And just in case anyone doesn't remember that, the nuking hurricanes thing, that was also a real thing that Trump asked about. He was wondering if we could, you know, calm down the atmosphere by detonating a nuclear bomb in the sky where a hurricane had formed. OK, yeah. I mean, at this point, I feel like we should all just be grateful that he didn't try to nuke COVID. We don't know that he didn't. Eli. Yep. Like, we're just now learning about this hurricane gun thing. Yep. I mean, Retracted. that could come out yet. Rolling Retracted. Stone, get on that. I would like to know. So here's how Trump got the hurricane gun idea in his head, I'm pretty sure. He definitely heard about something called cloud seeding, which means dropping salts and dry ice into clouds in order to induce more precipitation. That actually is a thing. And China has invested a bunch of money, and they do it to help with agriculture production. Trump... And the QAnon people are convinced that cloud seeding is a public double bluff about China actually having the X-Men powers of Storm and Iceman plus a really big fan. I don't know what he thinks it yeah, is. Based on that, the QAnon people also claim that Joe Biden acquired some of that secret weather gun technology from China and used it to shoot a really big icy storm into Texas to knock out their power grid right when Ted Cruz went to Cancun in order to make fun of Ted Cruz. Because, you know, we didn't have any jokes about Ted Cruz. <laughs> right, yeah, otherwise. How, how else would we make Ted Cruz look bad? <laughs> yeah, right. And, and, and to be clear, by the way, even cloud seeding is just barely a thing and might be bullshit. Okay, as, as near as I can tell, after 80 years of testing this internationally, we have like one clear indication that it might have like a like might make it fifteen percent more likely that it'll rain or snow on a given day at a given place. Like it's it almost nothing. Yeah, the, the CIA actually studied this to try to win Vietnam by like flooding the Ho Chi Minh Trail so that the other team couldn't transport stuff between North and South Vietnam. It didn't work. Nope. So apparently, a bunch of the White House staff spent four years running behind Trump like you do with a toddler, picking up, this is real, his literal mess of torn paper and Happy Meal wrappers and unclogging his toilets that were often clogged with torn paper and probably Happy Meal wrappers and talking him down from insane delusional nonsense like this. And I say like a toddler because according to former Trump aide Stephanie Grisham, quote, he would blurt out crazy things all the time and tell aides to do something about it. His staff would say they'd look into it, knowing that more often than not, he'd forget about it quickly 
much like a toddler, end quote. I just described the front runner for the GOP nomination in 2024. Yeah. And according to the Vegas odds, Trump is favored to win the whole thing over Biden and Harris. And of course, win the primary over DeSantis. We might have to use the hurricane gun is what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. So when Heath says the solution to our problems is a giant gun, it's just a joke. But when I, you know what? It's no fair. Brett Kavanaugh is the ring. Did I mention that Brett Kavanaugh is the ring? <laughs> it's not a gun. It's a fan. It's just a big box fan. Well, I, I, I really want to know what they're picturing. Whatever. On that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. And thanks to all the listeners who like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and send us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like Zach Guida, Vern Weisensell, Adrian D. Margulis, Dylan Hildebrand, Tressa Breen, Arcane, Matthew R., Alex Martinez, Kelly Spears, Ian Smith, Lucia B. I fucking love you guys. We love you too. We love you. Felix McCracken. Camp Quest Kansas City needs volunteers for August 2022. Apply at campquest.org. I'm in. Great cause. Rar Becca. Hazel Cat Lady. Taylor. At Rabbi Vernon Stickman. Toast. Julie Shepard. Sarah. Cursa Moon Whisper. Travis Collins. Vice Rhino. What up, Vice Rhino? Itai, Michael Miller, Daniel Kerr, Lobster Johnson, and Sarah Derry, whose beautiful dicks and vaginas inspire the vigorous orgasms that Joe Biden uses to attack the state of Texas when Ted Cruz is gone for spite. Yeah. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed. Available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all those other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Zlotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Drafts on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. And no amount of author, and no amount of author, and no amount of author. One of you say that word. Authoritarian. 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 Got it. I said it wrong when I tried to say it. <laughs> <laughs> and no amount of author. Authoritarian. Uh oh. Authoritarian. Here we go. Don't say author. And no amount of authoritarian is gonna. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed the pronunciation. I got the word because I was like, it's Thor. Thor, the god of thunder. The preceding podcast is a production of Puzzle and Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.